So excited to be here, and I slept two and a half hours last night, flew from L.A. Anybody sleep less than that, less than that? All right, how many, how many hours did you get? Three, four hours, okay, well, that's, I wish I had four. My wife, uh, Alexandra, she slept one hour last night getting ready for tonight. Guys, I'm telling you, you do not want to miss. So if you have junior high kids, high school kids, call them, text them, uh, DM them. If you're old, that means you go on Instagram. You go to there. No. It's going to be a great night. And um, I will tell you a little bit about what happened last night at the end. It was just such a powerful outreach that you were a part of, even though you weren't there in Los Angeles. But you reached thousands, really millions of people last night via uh, this outreach that we did. And, well, I'll just tell you right now. Gosh, it's, I can't help it. So because of your generosity, uh, you've helped mobilize 20,000 volunteers in the Los Angeles area from different churches, setting aside their egos and logos and church names and come together under one name, Jesus. And you helped... You helped several kids not be taken away from parents because you gave them mattresses, you gave them fridges so that they could have be, be in livable conditions. Um, you, helped, you helped facilitate the fostering of 1,500 kids that will now have a foster family. You helped eradicate $27 million of debt, medical debt, for people who have been going through it the last year so they can have a little boost. Yeah, I mean, just not to mention all the teams. Our team is still there. They're driving back today. Uh, they've been serving all week long at food shelters, and uh, Rashawn was at one yes, yesterday giving out 300 pairs of brand new shoes to homeless people, uh, the unhoused, and God, it just, the list goes on and on and on. And then last night, we rented out the SoFi Stadium where the Rams play, and um, it was a moment that will go down in history as it was, we were just trying to reach the world. So we invited the world, the world came, and uh, actors and actresses and uh, McGregor, the guy who was sitting, we sit on the front row with his broken leg there, and all of them heard the gospel of Jesus Christ. It was how Justin Bieber's on stage weeping, talking about how God is changing his life, and Tori Kelly and Chandler Moore and, and uh, Carrie Job, and it just, it was amazing. And um, for, for Justin Bieber to have 184 million people on his Instagram that he promoted this event to platforming us was insane. So you think, of, you think about the thousands of people, millions of people that saw and are going to be in heaven because of your generosity. Thank you. Gosh. So we reach out locally, we reach out nationally, we reach out uh, around the globe, and it just uh, there's always need, but we are always pouring out. So thank you, thank you, thank you. And today, pretty special day, guys. It's our anniversary. My wife and I have been married. Gosh. I remember when you first walked down the aisle at the old Campanile Theater in Antioch, California, where there was more duct tape than there was carpet <laughs> at the time. She walked in looking like a little Spanish princess, had baby's breath in the hair. I don't know why they call it baby's breath, because my baby's breath didn't smell like that. She was so beautiful, and she remains beautiful, and she is a very gracious woman of God. I'm very, very blessed. I love you. So I said I flew back for y'all. I, I, I made you feel like I flew back for you. I flew back for her today. No, I was both of you, both of y'all. But anyway, today's going to be a great day. Grab your phones out, grab your notes out, grab your Bibles out, and we're going to go into part two of a series we began last week, and it's called Poured Out. Poured Out. Everybody say, Poured Out. Poured out. Now, um, grab your notes, and if you're, if you're on a phone and you don't know how to get the Bible, guess what? Google knows the Bible. So just type in F I, I mean P H I L, <laughs> Phil, P H I L for Philippians, and then the number two, and that'll pull up the passage where we are right now. It's amazing, the power of the World Wide Web in your fingertips. And today I want to preach a message really that's going to help us move forward and understand why Jesus did what He did last week. So if you missed last week, go back and rewatch it. But today's sermon title is simply this. Don't let it stop with you. I said, don't let it stop with you. Legacy is always about a next generation. Everything you're building, you don't want it to stop with you. You want it to go on to the next generation. Whether you have your biological kids or some spiritual kids, you want what you're building to 
to be passed down. You want your values to be passed down. You want everything you're giving them to be passed down. The same is true with our Heavenly Father. Pour it out. Don't let it stop with you. Last week, I was in my car, and I had a bottle of water, and it had been sitting in my car, and the weather we've been having, which is like 400-degree weather we've been having, it's nuts, and it was boiling water in this nasty plastic bottle in my car, and it didn't seem refreshing at all, so I, I rolled my window down and poured it out on the concrete, to which my wife was walking out. She was like, what are you doing? I said, it's hot water. It's, it's gross, and it's been baking in plastic, which I heard the chemicals are released in that, and I don't want to put that in my system. So I poured it out. It was literally a waste of water. Poured it out, waste. Driving up from Los Angeles, there's a big pipe that is coming outside of a mountain and it has this water gushing out. And I thought, that too is a waste until somebody had explained to me. Like, I didn't know that the water was, was like gushing out of this pipe, but it wasn't just a waste. It was actually going into a filtration system that would turn around and be used to water all the crops in that area that would grow the crops that would go on to feed people around the globe. What I thought was a waste was actually poured out on purpose. Your life should not just be spilt. It ought to be poured out on purpose. And what God's poured into you, listen, don't let it stop with you. Come on, somebody say, it's not going to stop with me. As we look at this, keep that idea, that picture in your mind as we unpack this together. And I want you to understand that, that Jesus poured his life out. We talked about this in part one. He came down from heaven, became a man, the God man, lived a sinless life. He had to be sinless because he had to pay for our sin. You and I couldn't pay for it because we're sinners. We needed somebody who didn't have our problem, and here comes Jesus Christ. He dies on a cross, pays for our sin, and then offers free salvation to everybody who would call on his name and put their faith in him. He turns around, gives that, says, I now am the way, the truth, and the life, and the devil comes to steal, kill, and destroy, but I want you to have life to the fullest. And I don't believe that everybody is living life to the fullest. Fullest. I believe everybody that is here is living to some degree. We're all breathing to some degree, but we are not living to the fullest. And you won't live to the fullest until you allow him to fill you. So many people on that day when Jesus was hanging on a cross looked at this man, this God man, misunderstood to some and could not understand it. And that thought to themselves, what a waste. But it was no waste to him. Our Savior sovereignly, strategically sacrificed himself for our salvation. Anybody grateful that our God gave it all to us? He's, he's so extravagant, but he's not wasteful. He poured his life out, but he didn't spill it. He's extravagant in everything he does. Like his creation is extravagant. Like how much sky do we need? <laughs> but he's not wasteful. How many trees do we need? He's created all the trees, but he's not wasteful. He is so intentional and he's so willing. And most of us, you would agree with this, most people, including Christians, we live selfishly. Uh, we live to only please ourselves. We, we, we have this innate desire inside of all of us, and it's kind of a bent in our human nature, our fallen nature, to just live for ourselves. And it's encouraged in the world. It's almost take, like they take pride in it. And it's pitched to us in movies and in song lyrics and in social media. There is no shortage of supply of people promising you that contentment and fulfillment comes by you putting yourself first and only serving you. But all of us are searching for that fulfillment and what's crazy is we keep going after this crazy cycle and letting the world squeeze us into its mold. And all the time we're doing that, we're digging for the gold, but that's actually just digging us deeper into emptiness and unfulfillment. And as believers, we're not just called to a higher standard, we're called to a more fulfilling one. So when you follow Jesus, you now enter into a new fulfilled life that he came to bring. And here's what I want to talk to you about. Jesus poured his life out, and as he pours it out for you, it's our turn to pour it out for others. Last week, we looked at how Paul, in Philippians chapter 2, verse 1 through 12, talked about this to the church of Philippi. He's like, guys, guys, I want you to love each other. I want you to put each other first, like prefer each other, be of one mind, like love each other. And that's easier said than done. 
How many know some people you, you, you might love them, but you don't like them? Here's the problem with love. Part of loving is putting others first. So you can say, I love you. I love you. I love you. I love you. you don't mean it unless you put them first. This is part of what loving looks like. Jesus put us first. He showed us what love looks like. So here, let's go a step deeper. You ready for this? Unity, the world is all grasping for unity. Unity comes by demonstrating Jesus' example of putting others first. The world is desperately groping in the darkness right now, searching for unity. And I'm just here to tell you, they're not going to find unity until you come back to understanding that unity comes from demonstrating Jesus' mindset, his heart for putting people first. When you put people first and they put you first and I'm putting you first and you're putting me first and I'm preferring you, you're preferring me, unity comes that way. It does not come by the world simply demanding unity. We need unity. Well, how's that working? We scream unity. You can sing about unity, but unity will not come until we demonstrate Jesus' example of putting other people first. Now, um, Philippians 2, 5, we talked about this last week, says this, that your attitude, somebody say my attitude. Turn and tell somebody, I got attitude. That was the sermon title from last week in case you missed it, but you got to have the right attitude. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus. Your attitude should be the same as Jesus. What we learned is that your attitude is a choice. You get to pick your attitude. Some of you are like, yeah, I got attitude, all right. No, you get to pick it. So every day you wake up, you have a shelf kind of like really on your, on your proverbial dresser, and you get to pick which attitude you have today. I'm going to be angry. I'm going to be snooty. I'm going to be this. I'm going to be that. You, ha- you get to pick. It's almost like which shoes you wear and what shirts you wear. You get to pick which attitude you have. Here's what I know. You may not be able to control your circumstances around you. You can control your attitude. You can. You get to pick it. So don't just pick any attitude. Pick the same attitude Jesus had by giving his life away. That's how the world will know that we're his followers and that we're his his disciples, John 13 says. And I feel like there's a lot of us that have been confused on what does that love even look like. All right, here's the attitude of Christ. Philippians chapter 2, verse 6. Jesus who, although he existed in the form of God, did not regard equality with God a thing to be grasped. One translation says, literally, that he he didn't use it for his own advantage. He emptied himself of that with God, uh, equality with God a thing to be grasped, but he emptied himself. He he poured himself out, taking the form form of a bond servant. You know what a bond servant is? It's a servant who chooses to be. He didn't have to serve us. He chose to be. That's the kind of God we serve. He chose to be a bondservant, being made in the likeness of men, being found in appearance as a man. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even the death of a cross. Our Savior became flesh, died on a cross, and here's why. Even the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to lay down his life as a ransom for many. Okay, all of us have erred. All of us have sinned in life. We're born into it. Jesus saw that. You and I couldn't pay for our sin. So he says, I'm going to become one of you, and I'm going to pay for your sin because I'm the only one who can. I'm the only one who doesn't have a record. (laughs) That's what Jesus was like. So he comes in, and he, he, he formulates this plan, and he pours himself out. Okay, whenever Jesus pours himself out into us, he's fully expecting and anticipating us to pour ourselves into others. But you cannot do that unless you put others first and unless you have the same attitude. Okay, in order for us to have the same attitude, I'm trying to teach you something here, we need to train ourselves to think like Christ. We can't think like someone if we're not around someone. You get around your friends, you start to think like them. Show me your friends and I'll show you who you're becoming. Number two, we need the right influences of other believers. This is why small groups work. This is why small groups are not like an option. It ought to be a requirement for every believer because you're not going to do well as a follower of Christ unless you have a group of friends running the same way as you. So small groups are like, what is that? Well, there are a bunch of groups that are small. They're about to start up in a few weeks and they'll be, you'll be given a little card on your way out. You can scan it 
and fill it out to lead a small group. What's it like to lead a small group? It's really fun. And by the way, don't pick another meeting to add to your week. We're meeting out. Gosh, I don't want another meeting. But what are you already doing that could be turned into ministry? Like, what do you do during the week? I work out. I like food. I like the barbecue. I like scrapbook. I like the dog walk. I like Bible study. Pray, whatever it is, you can gather for almost any reason. We're going to help train you to take what you're already doing and turn it into ministry to reach your friends. It's, it is so critical you have a group of people in your corner before you get in trouble. Because when you're in trouble, it's hard to find some friends. You need some people that are there for you, that can challenge you, that can encourage you, that can pray with you, and you need to do the same for them. Get in a small group. This is how we pastor people, so if you want to lead one, let us know, and we'll help you. Number three, you need to make the Word of God our ultimate authority. Let me pause here for a second and just say that the Word of God, like, what changes a person is not, can I... Can I just be real honest with you? I don't, I, before I say it, I don't want you to be like, what, who's he talking about? I'll be gentle when I say it, but what changes a person is obedience to God's word, not just exposure to it. Because you can have two people that hear the same word. One person obeys the word of God, another doesn't. This person sees blessing, this one doesn't. It's not just being around it, it's like obey, obeying the word of God, letting the word of God pour into your life, and then you receive that and do something with it. And, and, and we have the word of God, the Bible, almost as a as selected reading, almost like it's, a, like it's an elective class. We got all these other philosophies and all these other teachers and, and bloggers and social media people and, and st superstars that are saying their opinion on stuff, and we, we, we elevate the word of God or, or their, their voice to the same level as, I as if... As if, as if, these random people would have the wisdom from heaven to tell us how to live our life when their life is falling apart. Let's come back to the word of God. Fall in love with the Jesus of the Bible, not just the Jesus of religion or something that you have made up in your mind. Come back to the, the authority of scripture. And then number four, we need sac sacrificial service. You need an outlet where you can actually do the stuff. Because if you're just receiving, 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 pretty soon, you're like the Dead Sea. You start to stink. Soil. Like the reason the Dead Sea is called the Dead Sea is because it has an inlet, but it has no outlet. That's how a lot of believers are. It's like, feed me, pour into me. And after a while, you don't have an outlet. It's just, whoo. Their attitude is funky. <laughs> Philippians chapter 2. We looked at the Philippians 2, 1 through 12. Let's pick it up where Paul left off. Last week, Jesus pouring into us. This week, it's us pouring into others. Therefore. Now, any time you see the word therefore, you always want to ask yourself, what's it there for? It's a biblical, hermeneutical approach to scripture. So all this beforehand about Jesus pouring himself out, emptying, emptying himself for us, therefore, because of this, my dear friends, as you've always obeyed, not only in my presence, but now much more in my absence, continue to work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Like, this is a constant journey. And if you're not there yet, if you haven't arrived spiritually, guess what? Welcome to the club, all right? It, we're all on a growth track with this thing, but work it out. And, and, and not just a fear of, I'm afraid, but there ought to be a holy reverence for the word of God and his presence. For it is God who works in you to will. He gives us the desire to, to act in order to fulfill his good, shout this word out. Come on, shout it out. Purpose. Now, here's where it gets to, to the nitty gritty. Do everything without grumbling or arguing. Nobody has this tattooed on their arm. Like some of y'all getting verses tattooed on. I can do all things through Christ. Ain't nobody got to do everything without grumbling and complaining. <laughs> and you know what everything means? You know what the word everything means? Every thing. Every stinking thing. Everything in your entire existence. Do it without grumbling, without arguing, without gossiping, without slandering. 
so that you may become blameless and pure children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. He's talking 2,000 years ago. My God, what would he think about today? He thought it was crooked and warped then. What? Where are we now? What if, I don't even know what the word we would use for our generation. He says, then you will shine bright like a dime. No, he didn't say that. <laughs> he, said, he, said, he said, then you will shine. Well, stay with me, stay with me. You'll shine among them. Who's them? The warped and crooked generation that we live in. You'll shine like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. You see, the, the reason that a lot of believers' light has been growing dim is because they have held loosely the word of God. When you hold tight to it, you stand out. Not in a bad way, not in an arrogant way, not in a holier-than-thou way. You represent his love. Jesus said the world will know that you're my disciples because you love each other. Like, really love and prefer each other. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. Like, we're all going to stand before God one day. The question is, are you, are you ready? Because I want to help you get ready. You don't have to fear that day. You can actually look forward to that day. And you don't have to pay for that day because he already paid for it. But we all will stand before Christ one day. And you can make peace with him today. But even if I am being, watch this, here it is, here it is, here it is. Even if I'm being poured out as a drink offering upon the sacrifice and service of your faith, I rejoice. Like, this brings me the greatest joy if I could just do that. If I could, if I could consider my life like a drink offering, if I could just pour it out, it would bring me so much joy in my life. This is Paul, okay? Let's, let's unpack his life for a second. Before he knew Jesus, he was not a nice guy. He would actually take Christians and throw them in prison for believing and teaching Christ and uh, probably killed some. So this guy, Paul, studied under a guy named Gamaliel in Acts chapter two or 22. Gamaliel was a Pharisee, and, and Paul was on track to become a Pharisee. He was a Pharisee among Pharisees, and he, he had a very cushy career ahead of him. Let's just say that. He was on track. He's climbing success ladder. He's doing all these things. And then all of a sudden, in Acts 9, he has an encounter with Jesus that would flip his world upside down. Now, I know not everybody believes what we believe that is listening online and in this room, but can I just tell you, there are many people in this room that we were going our way, a way that would lead us to emptiness and shame and resentment, and Jesus, he came and stopped us right smack dab in our tracks, showed us his love, showed us his grace, pushed our shame, and passed away. We turned around. Our world has been flipped upside down. Same guy, same guy in the very next chapter writes a very distinct verse. He says, but whatever was gains to me, get, like anything I thought was a gain back before I knew Jesus, I now consider loss. Not like, oh, I lost it. I lost my wallet. Where's my wallet? Where's my phone? Not that type of loss. He's like, like weight loss. Nobody here cries over weight loss. I, I lost 10 pounds a day. <laughs> this week I lost 15 pounds. He says, I consider this stuff lost. Why, 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 why? Because I just want to know Christ. What's more, I consider everything lost because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ my Lord. He considered knowing Jesus the, 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 the most important thing in the entire world, for whose sake I have lost all these things, I consider them garbage that I could just gain Christ. And it's not that everything in his life was garbage, but by comparison, he's like, I, this stuff means nothing to me. I want to know Christ. He was on path to have a great career. It was going to be world changing. He was going to have a cushy position. He's like, that means nothing to me. What does it profit a man to gain the entire world and lose my soul? He said, I just want to know Christ because this Jesus I met, he's changed me. He's, he's not like any other man I've ever met. And so this guy begins to, to literally lay down his life, live his life in such a way where he poured it out for other people. He poured it out so much so that in 2 Corinthians, 2 Timothy, he's writing his very last book. He would write 13 books of our New Testament. 
he would write these books, and the last one he's writing from the dungy, dingy Mamertine prison. It's a hole in the ground. I've been there. He's writing this to encourage a young pastor, and he says this. He says, my life has been poured out like a drink offering. To un- understand this, you have to go back into the deep pages of the Old Testament where Jesus, through the pen of these Old Testament prophets, would require a sacrifice. Now, let me just say this. Uh, they would do animal sacrifice because God instituted it. Let me just, I know it sounds weird. Follow me. He said, I want you to give me the first lamb or the first perfect lamb. Had to be perfect. Had to, had, could, don't be giving me some runt of the, li- I want the f- first and the best because that's going to be a tithe to me kind of thing. And it's also a foreshadow of Jesus becoming the perfect lamb of God who would be sacrificed for us. So all these Old Testament priests would do this, and I wouldn't make a, a good Old Testament priest. I have a weak stomach and uh, don't like blood, so I'm really glad I'm New Testament guy. And Because you guys would be coming with me with stuff, and I'd have to you know, kill animals. I, I wouldn't be good. I just, I'm not going to be able to worship God today. I just, I'm going to call in sick. But one of the things would, would be, was required, it was a drink offering. They would pour wine over the sacrifice, expensive wine, good wine, or oil. So it cost them something. It was a sacrifice, but it was a foreshadow of Jesus, because oil in the New Testament represents the Holy Spirit, and the, the wine represents the blood of Christ, who would one day go on to become the Lamb of God, who would shed his blood to pay for the sins of mankind. So since Jesus Thank God we don't have to do sacrifices anymore because that's weird. (laughs) This guy, Paul, would go on to have ministry trips around the globe. Anybody have a a Bible with you? You get extra credit in heaven, all of you. (laughs) All right, I'm telling you, you need to get a Bible with pages. Like the Google and the apps, those are great, but there ain't nothing like seeing it and highlighting it. All right, if you go to the back of your Bible with pages, there are, there's maps. Some of y'all didn't know this. There's maps there. And you can see the journeys, the three missionary trips that Paul took, planting churches. And I mean, this is old school, it, like, like, like legit. There's no Southwest flights. He's walking on a camel riding, shipwrecked snake bitten. I mean, this guy was giving his life away to just tell people about Jesus. And because of that, the church of Jesus, it just caught fire in the New Testament and changed the world. He would write 13 books of our Bible, but this guy poured his life out in the process. Can can I read just a snippet of what he went through by pouring his life out? He says, I've worked much harder. I've been in prison more frequently. Okay. You might have been in prison, but probably not for preaching Jesus. He has been in prison more frequently, been flogged more severely. I've been exposed to death again and again. Five times I received from the Jews 40 lashes minus one. You know how Jesus was beaten? Paul had that five times. Five times, all for preaching Christ. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned like they tried to kill him with rocks. Three times I was shipwrecked. I spent a night and day in the open sea. I have been constantly on the move. I have been in danger from rivers, danger from bandits, danger from my fellow Jews, danger from the Gentiles, danger from the city. Like, we get it, Paul. You've been in danger. Danger in my country, danger in the sea, danger from false believers. I have labored and toiled and have often gone without sleep. I've known hunger and thirst. I've often gone without food. I have been cold. I've been naked. Besides everything else I've faced all day long, I face the pressures and concerns of all these churches. Like all my spiritual kids, I want to make sure they're doing good. This is what him pouring his life out looked like. And we have a problem serving in kids' church. We have a problem going through growth track, getting on a dream team to pour out just a little bit. We have a hard time serving our community or serving your family. Like you might be able to serve church people, but you don't like your family. What a man this was. 
He understood that Jesus poured into him and it could not stop with him. I'm so grateful that it didn't stop with him because he was the greatest missionary the world has ever known. We're sitting here right now. Our city, Antioch, is named after the city he's from. This guy's pouring out his life and I'm afraid that in our Americanized view of Christianity, we have reduced the pouring out to the most elementary aspects of our faith. Like for, for most believers, they feel like the highest duty of a Christian is just to attend church occasionally or watch it online. They feel like they're crushing it as a Christian. If we just attend church, well, that's where you're being poured into, but there is no pouring out. It's interesting because the people you look up to in life, they're not selfish. The people you look up to in life, they have a great attitude. They have, they're filled with joy. They're giving their life away. They're sacrificing. They're people who, who've given their lives away. And it's always funny to me because the people who sacrifice the most, you talk to them, like, I can't believe you did this. You've laid down your life. Oh, you've given so much. They're always like this. Oh, baby, that's, that, that's no big deal. They don't even consider it a sacrifice. And then you got the folks who ain't sacrificed but a little bit. And they want to tell you how much they have sacrificed. Oh, I have given so much for the Lord. I mean, I am God's skip. God, the, the, this church ought to be very thankful for me and my gifts. Oh, I don't want to serve. I just want to sing a solo every once in a while. What? Who in the world? Is this helping? Like, understanding sacrifice is critical. Can I, let me just give you a quick definition, right? Sacrifice is this. It's giving up something you value for something you value more. When you tithe, you're taking something you value and sacrificing for something you value more, putting God first. When you give, you're sacrificing something you value for something you value more. When you give of your time, your time is very valuable. But there are moments, like our team serving in Los Angeles, picking up trash, helping the unhoused this week, serving at the Dream Center and, and whatnot. We're, we're giving of our time. Our time is precious. It costs people money to go down there or to serve in our city. But you're giving up something you value for something you value more. The question is, what do you value more? Where does your time, energy, money go to? Because that will determine and that will depict what really is priority in your life. Most people think that the ultimate sacrifice of a believer is just to attend church or watch it occasionally online, and we are missing it. God has so much more for you. And fulfillment doesn't come from just receiving. It comes from receiving and pouring, receiving and pouring, receiving and pouring. That's when you come alive. Like, you think about it, there's even a chemical that's released in your brain when you give or do something kind for something. You feel happy, like, hmm, I did that. <laughs> like, go out to eat today and have a sandwich and leave the biggest tip you possibly can and walk out and see if you don't feel, <laughs> what? Or just watch them from your car, like, watch it. They're going to think it's a mistake. They're going to think it's a mistake. They're going to come back. Hey, here she comes. Here she Was that a mistake? Mm -mm. God loves you, no strings attached. You watch, something's just... In your brain. Who put that there? Evolution didn't put that there. A monkey didn't put that there. God put that there. He wired us to serve. He wired us to give. He wired us that way to make a difference. It's not a waste. Many people think it's a waste. Let me just illustrate this real quick for you. This, this is what happens. This is our life. When we come to Jesus, we're empty or we're filled with the wrong stuff, all right? So what happens is God fills us up. And you have a couple of options. You had a couple of options. Number one, you can pour your life into someone else. Some people say, man, that's a waste. It wasn't a waste. It's actually bringing nutrients to something that's growing. Whenever you pour your life into someone else or for another cause, for the kingdom of God, that will last forever. And can, may I also say, my wife and I, over the last several years, we've even determined where we give. Like we give here, we give, we, we give to, to organizations, but I want to know that what I give will show up in eternity. I don't want to just give to good causes. Is the name of Jesus attached to it? Are they hearing about the love of God somehow? Because otherwise I feel like it's just, oh, uh, it's a waste. Like you spill your life out. 
And when God comes in, he's, he's looking to see who can I pour into that's going to be faithful to pour that out to somebody else. You don't want to be the one where it stops with you. And when we pour out, it's a joy. Jesus poured his life out and then turned around and had the audacity to call the cross joy. Are you kidding, Jesus? There's nothing joyful about the cross. I mean, to have his hands nailed to a tree, his feet nailed to a tree, ripped, his back shredded, and now he has a crown of thorns on his head, weeping, drops of blood coming out. And he says, this brings me the most joy in the whole wide world. How could he say that? I'll tell you how. Because he wasn't looking at that current circumstance. He was looking ahead to see what this sacrifice was going to impact thousands and billions and billions of people that will end up in heaven. And the same is true with you. When you pour out your life, do not just look at your current circumstance and feel like I'm being used. No, look ahead. See about all the thousands and millions of people that will be in heaven one day because you poured your life out. Every time we give or tithe or do a food outreach or a backpack distribution or we plant churches or we give around the world or you do the event last night in L.A., we are pouring out, pouring out, pouring out. And I always think it's funny. We always want people to pour into us, but who are you pouring into? We, like if we're asking God, pour into me, can he trust you? to pour that out into somebody else? Or will it stop with you? Will you keep it all? Like we're blessed to be a blessing. When my daughters were young, I remember giving one of them a treat. We have four daughters. Gave them a treat. Said, hey, go share this with your sisters. The benevolent father was blessing my daughters with a treat. I entrusted the treat to one of my daughters to distribute to all of the daughters. Come to find out, she ate it all herself. You ready for this? You ready for this? This is, this is big, okay? God's looking for people he can pour through, not just pour on. Woo! I said God's looking for people he can pour through, not just pour on. Anything God pours into you, he wants to pour through you. And, 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 and here's another question. What are you filling yourself with? Because you can only pour out what's been poured in. We have a widespread issue in our generation of people receiving from different streams, which is fine as long as all those streams are healthy ones. <laughs> Problem is they're not all healthy. Some of them are toxic. So when you get a healthy stream and a toxic one, you, you have one stream that is uh, the, like the Bible and another is the news. It's feeding your spirit. Then you have one that's church and one that's social media. And then you have one that's God and one that's gossip. Well, if you have two streams coming to one source and one is toxic and one is healthy, the toxic will contaminate the healthy. Like we understand that. Well, you just need to realize that, that like what voices are you listening and allowing in your life during this season? Because if the word of God says, like in our first passage, do everything without grumbling, complaining, no gossip. That the, okay, if the word of God says that, and then one of your streams is that, it's time to build a dam and say, no more. You're not pouring into me anymore because if I allow you to pour into me, that's what's going to be poured out of me. Be careful what you let in because what you let in will come out. And find somebody else to pour into. Lead a small group, everybody. You don't have to be the perfect Christian in the whole wide world to lead a small group. You get with a few other people and be like, man, I want to grow just like you. Let's do it together. Yeah. So, so you, you can sign up to lead one today. They start in a few weeks. And, and can I also say this? Gosh, there's just so much. It's just dripping with urgency. But realize that some people you pour into, they're going to spill. Because don't you get mad? Like my daughters when they were young. <laughs> when they were young. My daughters, I would pour in their glass, and then, you know, they're little. So they were like, oh, thanks. Oh, Daddy, I'm so sorry. I didn't be like, forget it then. You're cut off. <laughs> no, he came over, helped clean it up. Okay, let's pour it again. Two hands this time. Just because other people spill what you pour doesn't negate the value of what you're pouring. Like, 
Jesus poured into 12, one of them spilled. <laughs> His name was Judas. So just because you're pouring and other people spill it doesn't mean that, you, that it doesn't take away from the quality of what you're pouring. Keep pouring your life out. Even though nobody sees it, keep pouring. Even though nobody gives you an applause, keep pouring. Even though nobody recognizes you and gives you a shout out, keep pouring your life out because God sees it. And then let's not spill what he's pouring into us. He's poured in so much. Let's not just be frivolous with this. And, and, and let's, to spill is an accidental waste. But to pour is an intentional investment. We're pouring our life out. And all this is done. Let me give you this, I'll, and then I'm done. The motivation is so key and vital to this, for this to work for us. And I want to show you Paul, the same guy. He writes in Romans chapter 12, therefore, I urge you, I'm like I'm pleading with you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy. Woo! Can you read these five words? In view of God's, come on, one more time. In view of God's, offer your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy, pleasing to God. This is your true and proper worship. One translation says, this is your reasonable act of worship. Let me explain it. So when you give your life as a living sacrifice to God, oftentimes we think, oh, I'm giving God so much. Like, he is blessed because I'm giving him me. <laughs> Everything we do for God and others is no big sacrifice at all. It's just reasonable. It's just reasonable. It's a reasonable response. Let me explain it this way. Our motivation, it's all about your view. People love a good view. Pay high dollar for a good view. Travel around the world just to see a pretty and amazing, breathtaking view. Can I show you a view? Can, can I show you the best view you have ever seen? Let me take you to the top of Golgotha's hill, where Jesus hung, bled, and died. Our God-man Jesus, who took our place on an old rugged cross. And listen, not because we deserved it, or paid for it, or earned it. It was simply out of his amazing grace. He gave us something we did not deserve. And out of his mercy, withholding the judgment we did deserve. It's in view, in view of God's mercy. Because of God's mercy, we will now willingly lay down and pour out our lives. And when other people say, oh, you're wasting your life. What a waste. You spilled your life out. We say, oh, no. Let me tell you why. When they say, why'd you do it? You just simply say, because because God had mercy on me, because you had no idea where I was before Jesus Christ found me, you had no idea the depression I was in, you, know, you have no clue. I was on the edge of my bed ready to take my entire life and God stepped in. Oh, this is just reasonable. And in view of that now, let me lay my life down for other people. He pours in, we pour out. He pours in, we pour out. Don't let it stop with you. And I'm convinced, I'm convinced that people who have yet to respond to the love of God, they just haven't seen the view. What are we doing here at church? We just grab you by the hand. Hey, can I show you the best view you've ever seen? I love, I love outdoors. I love a good view. And I love to show people. When I find a good view, I love to show them. Grab them, you hike. Take them on a journey. Follow, follow me, follow me. Because they don't know where it is. Follow me, follow me. Oh, you're going to love this. Pull in, do the big reveal. <sighs> a friend of mine from Arkansas came, one of our overseers, Rick Bezet. And Treasure Island has, it's so pretty. You drive on Treasure Island at nighttime, you can see the city. So I drive in. I'm trying not to let him see the city. I say, don't look to the left. Don't look to the left. Don't look to the left. We finally park there, get out of the car, and we just see the most pretty sky, the prettiest skyline, I believe, in, in the nation. That's what you're doing. Your neighbors haven't seen the view yet. 
So you're just going to take him on a journey. What? F- follow me because I, I'm going to show you something. Where are we going? Oh, you're going to love it. What, what's it going to be like? Trust me. Your life will never be the same. But they need someone to lead them there because they don't have the directions to get there on their own. You're pouring your life out. You're helping them see it. And so this is why we say today, like today, decide I'm jumping in growth track the first weekend of August. So on the other side of that wall, three services. It's a three-week class. You can join the church, hear the vision of the church, get on the team, or jump in a small group or lead a small group. And then start to look around your city. Like, who can you serve today? Who can, not just here in these four walls, but like live a lifestyle of pouring your life out. And when you do, you do it without grumbling and without complaining. And you call it joy. This last, I'll give you this last thought. It's not in my notes, but this is our life. And this is ministry down here. This is all the people that you are going to touch and help and minister to. All right? This is them. This is you. This is them. This is God. We, can't, we have nothing to give them. And the problem is a lot of people, they have, just because they have an Instagram doesn't mean they have something to give you. Just because they have the platform doesn't mean what they have is going to fill you. So the world's like, Follow me, listen to me. I got the answer, I got the answer. They're empty. So we come to God. He fills us. Now, this is ministry below, right? What happens is God fills us up and we pour out and it's amazing. You're able to bless other people because God has blessed you. But then you're empty. And many people spend their time focusing here instead of focusing here. Don't just focus here, focus here. This is what ministry looks like. It's God pouring into you. And out of the overflow, you begin to minister and pour your life out to others. The same grace he gives you, you give into them. Same peace he gives you, you pour into them. Are you getting this? Jesus poured his life out. Don't let it stop with you. It's time to pour your life into somebody else. Would you bow your heads with me? Hmm. This series has so moved my heart. Uh, I pray it moves yours as well. But we're all going to stand before God one day. For some people, that's a scary thing. I'm just here to tell you it doesn't have to be. You can make peace with God right here, right now. And a lot of people have a, a wrong view of God. You know, they, I talk about having the right view of God. A lot of people have the wrong view. People have taken... People have taken you to a wrong mountain and pointed you and said, that's God, and it's not him. It's a wrong view of him. It's a wrong perception of him. Whatever your view is that's not from the Bible, come back to the Bible and get your view from from who Jesus said he is. In the New Testament, he is a God who saves. He's a God who loves. He's a God who is willing to pour his life out for you. And there's nothing you can do that can separate you from the love of God. Now, we will stand before God one day and give account. And if you're not ready, I'd like to help you get ready today. I've done my best to try to present Jesus in the proper manner. I pray that anything that is not from God would be quickly forgotten. But anything that is, that would, it would go deep into your, your soul and never leave you. Some lives are getting ready to change. I want to ask you, I'm going to lead you in a prayer right now. If you would like to say, Sean, count me in that prayer when you pray it. I want to give my life to Jesus here, now. Don't feel like you got to fix yourself first because that doesn't even make sense. We can't fix ourselves. That's why we need Jesus right here, right now. Somebody breaks a leg and and the ambulance shows up, they don't say, hey, hold on, guys, let me fix myself before you fix me. No, that's silly. In the same manner, let's not do that to God. Hold on, God, let me, let me fix myself, and then I'll come to you. <laughs> you see the logic? 
So if you're here and you say, Sean, I just need to give my life to Christ. I need a fresh start. I need him to forgive me. I need to, I need to, I need to have a trust relationship that's active and living with him. I'm going to ask you to lift your hand in just a second and say, count me in that prayer. Some of you, you were close to God, but you drifted away. You're not where you used to be. You're not where you ought to be. And this, this, it's okay. But just take a step towards him now. All right, this is you online or in this room. Count me in this prayer, Sean. I'm in. On the count of three, lift your hand right where you are. And when you lift it up, just leave it up for a minute so I can see it. Nobody else is looking. I just want to acknowledge. One, two, three. Three, lift it up and just leave it up. Yes, 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 pour into you, you're going to pour into others, and it's going to keep on going because it will not stop with us. I'll give you the words now. Let's all say it out loud. Just say, Lord Jesus, thank you for loving me first. Today I give you my life. Thank you for pouring your life out for me. I receive your grace. I receive your forgiveness. I repent of my sin. I turn to you. Fill me and I promise to pour out for others. In Jesus' name. What's God saying to some of you right now? Just kind of think about it. You don't have to say it out loud, but just in your heart, just ask God, what are you trying to show me? What are you, what are you highlighting right now? Lord, I thank you for my friends watching online. Thank you for those in this room. We just commit a fresh commitment in view of your mercy to lay down our lives as a sacrifice for you. We're in. We're, we're in. What, what other response could we have after you've been so good to us? It is a joy to serve people in your name. May you receive all the glory, all the credit, all the praise, all the honor that is due your name forever and ever and ever and ever.